Welcome back, everybody. Um, yeah, and thank you, first of all, to Leslie for inviting me to um, convene this panel. And thank you for the shout out earlier on the raffles uh, edited volume, much appreciated. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here today. I think this is a really pertinent um, debate and the issues that are going on. It's even interesting from the first speaker and the questions and issues raised there. There's a lot of, I think, parallels with what's happening across Southeast Asia in general. Um, so maybe that's something we can we can think about as we as we progress. But yeah, I'm really happy today. We have three speakers, um, all based in Indonesia. Um, and as you heard, um, Echo is online. I presume he's there. So I'll introduce Echo first, and then we'll we'll go from there. So yeah, Mr. Echo Bastiawan is an independent researcher. He's based at Malang in Java, um, and he's a member of the ERC Java project. Um, He's also an Alphawood uh, alumni. He completed his postgraduate diploma in Asian art in 2016 and his master's in history and art and archaeology in 2017, also with uh, on the SAP program. <clears throat> his master's research focuses on miniature bronzes from Central and East Java groups. Uh, he's interested in old Javanese inscriptions. And as I said, he's been part of the ERC Dharma project since 2019. Uh, he is active in local communities in East Java. We've just heard some about that. So that's great. We have some uh, tie-ins here. And he aims to preserve and conserve archaeological remains. Yeah. And his paper is the story behind Prasati Sungaran. So Echo, um, if you're all ready to go, I'll hand over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the organizer for inviting me. Um, sorry for the <laughs> nice background. It's a... Uh, uh, market prayer. Um, today I'm going to be uh, talking about the Pasasti Sangguran. So Pasasti is, is an Indonesian word. Um, basically it means um, inscriptions in English. Documents um, written um, in more durable materials such as stones or um, plates. So um, um, today the next 20-25 uh, minutes we are gonna see how the stone travels from Java to Scotland. And we will also see possible places of the discovery of the stone. And we'll talk a little bit about the content of the inscriptions and also a discussions on a replica made by the local people of Mandat of, um, from where the stones are believed to be originated. And as a disclaimer, I'm not gonna um, talk about the issue of the restitutions today. Um, it's rather a sensitive um, 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 things to discuss. So um, I guess it's, it's a good idea for me to not, to not talk about it um, for the time being. So the island of Java, a for long Dutch possession, came under a brief period of British rule after Napoleon's annexations of Holland in um, 1810. In 1811, headed by Lieutenant Governor Thomas Stamford Raffles, under the supreme authority of the Governor General of India, Lord Minto, a new administration was set up in Java. Raffles, 30 years of age at that time, had a keen interest in Japanese history and culture. He was an enthusiastic antiques collector who had no qualms about acquiring priceless historical artifacts and sending them back to Britain. Lieutenant Colonel McKenzie, Colin McKenzie, sorry, who had served as a chief engineer of the British Expeditionary Force to Java, was ordered with researching Java's historical past and, when feasible, obtaining the specimen. McKenzie was particularly interested in written documents, notably ancient stone and metal inscriptions, um, which some of them he brought back to India in July. 1813, and one of the objects that he collected was the Prasasti Sanguran. Early in 1812, the stone of Sanguran was removed from the hill region of Malang on the command of the local region, or Bupati, in Indonesia, named Kiai Tumanggung Kertanegara, and transported to the town of Bangil in Pasuruan, then to Surabaya, where it was delivered to India as a gift from Ravels to his patron, Lord Minto. A ship landed at Calcutta in June 1813, 
carrying a present for Lord Minto. Mackenzie had sent it from Java with the following description, a stone engraved on both sides with ancient characters in a high state of preservation. Minto was overjoyed with it. He had been informed of its impending arrival and had written Raffles in this enthusiastic letter. I am very grateful for the great stone from the interior of your island, which you tell me in your letter of the 5th May was put on board the Matilda. The Matilda has not yet arrived, so I have not received Colonel Mackenzie's account of this curiosity, which in weight at least seems to rival the base of Peter the Great statue at Petersburg. I shall be very much tempted to mount this Java rock upon our Minto crates, that it might tell Eastern tales of us long after our heads lie under Subutar stones. Minto at the end had the stone ship to Britain, where it is still on display in the grounds of his family estate near Hewitt in Roxburghshire. After being replaced as a governor general in December 1813, just six months after receiving the stone, Lord Minto returned to England in apparent good health. However, his condition quickly deteriorated and he died on the 21st of June, 1814, on his way to Scotland at Stevenage. The stone found a new home in the Scottish borderlands, some 12,000 kilometers from its original resting place. There it stands to this day in the grounds of the historical state of the Earls of Minto, for which reason it has come to be known as the Minto Stone. The Minto Stone was not the only stone inscription sent to India during the administration of Brothels. Another significant stone inscription called Puchangan, issued by King Airlangga, dated to uh, 963 Saka, was also brought along. So earlier I mentioned that the stone, um, the Sanguran stone was removed from the hill area of Malang, but there is actually no record that mentioned the exact locations of where the stones um, originated. In the history of Java, Raffles mentioned stone found near Surabaya and sent from thence to Bengal to the right honorable to all of Minto. However, there can be no doubt that the stone was in fact discovered in the hill region of Batu to the northwest of Malang. It is supported by Mackenzie's letter to Lord Minto dated April 11, 1813, which states, I had it carried down with the concern and by the assistance of the native region from Malang, an inland district about 40 miles southeast of Pasuruan, or Pasuruan nowadays, to Surabaya where it was shipped. Further support um, comes from NJ Chrome's 1917's article discussing Colonel Adam's trip to Malang and Antang in the month of June 1814. Adams described the ruins of Hindu temple about halfway between Malang and Batu. And in the next sentence refers to a large inscribed stone found by Mackenzie in the same neighborhood and sent by him to Lord Minto. Based on this Colonel Adams report, Chrome concluded that the Minto stone came from the village of Ngandat, where the temple remains were discovered later in the 19th century. So Ngandat is now the name of the small hamlet in Desa Mojo uh, The area is very rich in archaeological remains, and there are two locations which have temple remains that can be associated with the Colonel Adams report and possibly have a close connection to the stone. So the two important places that we are going to talk about is the Situs Mojerejo and Situs Pendam, as you can see on the map. And the name of Ngandat is now a small hamlet where the replica of the Prasasti Sangguran is situated. So we are now traveling to East Java, most, specific, most specifically on the foot of Mount Kawi and Arjuna Walirang, which sadly you cannot see on the map. Uh, um, not far from the uh, replica of the Pasati Sangurans to the east, uh, one can find Situs Mojarjo and also Situs Pendam, separated by the Brantas River. So if you can see my slide, so uh, my cursors. So this Brantas River is um, plays very important roles in the um, ancient history of Java. 
substantial number of archaeological remains have been discovered along this, this, this river. All right, so this is the first place that many people in general thought to be the origins of the Sanguran stone. Um, the site has been used by locals as a Punden Desa. So Punden here refers to sort of the most sacred place in the village where people often visit for the special occasions. And as far as I'm concerned, the place has never been excavated by the East Java Archaeological Bureau, although remains of ancient block of stones are still there. So uh, this site has long been considered by many people as the place where the Sangura stone originated, because in the past, this is the only place which has um, quite a large amount of um, temple ruins. Until recently, um, a new site was discovered that um, sort of opened a new discussions, a uh, new possibility of where the Sangura stones could be um, originated. That is the situs or Chandi Pendem or Temple Pendem. In 2019, in the hamlet of Pendem, village Pendem, Batu City, a farmer reported a discovery of a structure made of bricks. Subsequently, the East Java Archaeological Bureau made a series of excavations throughout 2019-2020. And in total, there were four excavations conducted by the PPJP or the East Java Archaeological Bureau. The site itself is located on the lower part of the Brandas River in a complex of a public cemetery. Not far from the discovery of the structure, one can find a yoni and a nandi, a sculpture of a bull, of a bull which are placed under a small chunko, a gazebo-like building. And these two sculptures have been considered sacred by locals, and they were also made as a punden. Again, punden refers to um, 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 the most sacred place in the village where people often go there for these special occasions. The excavation led by an archaeologist, um, Wichaksono Dwi Nugroho of the East Java Archaeological Bureau, have resulted in several informations. With the presence of Yoni and Nandi, the structure, square in form and facing is, can be identified as Chandi or temple with a Zephaistic background. Not far from the excavated structure, the team has also discovered this three headed Siva. The Paripih box, which usually contains gold leaf and precious metals or stones, and placed in the heart or called Sumuran of the temple, was also discovered. However, its contents were lost at the times of the discovery. It is also evident that sometimes in the past, illegal excavation was done for unclear reasons, perhaps in search for the precious metals. Interestingly, though, two Dutch coins with the date 1825 and 1826 were also discovered during the excavation. The team concluded that the structure and the object of, uh, um, of discovered on the site all point to the 10th century or even earlier and might be related to the Sanguran inscriptions. Well, for now, we still do not know for sure whether the site was the temple or the holy place mentioned in the inscriptions, which, are, uh, which I will discuss shortly later, or even the place where the stone once stood. We have the evidence that the stone's inscriptions, um, which was placed inside the temple complex, um, uh, found in the Kamakan site um, called the Masar inscriptions dated to 852 Saka. So basically issued only two years after the Sanguran stone. Uh, stone. So this stone was found near the structure that was excavated by the Archaeological Bureau of East Java in February uh, 2022 in, in Mojokerto. Uh, given the fact that the Situs Pendem is located not far from Situs Mojorojo, the previous site, uh, further research needs to be carried out to know more about the, uh, the connections of these two places. Uh, on the northwest of Situs Mojorojo and Situs Pendem, there is a Ganesha known to be called as Ganesha Torongrejo. So Torongrejo here referring to the name of the village um, where the Ganesha is um, situated. In the past, there were reportedly several other sculptures apart from the Ganesha 
uh, namely Anandi and also Tuarapala, a figure of a guardian, but they are have been lost now. The Kanisa stands overlooking the Tempuran or the meeting of the two rivers, the Prantas Lanang River, the male one, and the Prantas Wedok River or the female one. The Tempuran or the meeting spot between two rivers is considered sacred in Javanese belief. Again, it is not yet clear from what period this Kanisa was produced. And as far as I'm concerned, no serious excavation or research um, have been conducted for this Kanisa and its surrounding. But it clearly shows that the area is indeed very rich in archaeological remains. Uh, now that we have visited two possible places of the origin of the stone and other archaeological remains that might be connected to the Prasasti Sangguran, let us now move to the content of the inscription. While in general, people are well aware about the current location of the stone, as well as the history of how it ended up in, uh, in there in Scotland, the content of the inscriptions has never become a serious subject of discussion, except for the curse formula generally found in any inscriptions that become very popular. And oftentimes people would link it to the misfortune events experienced by Lord Minto, Ruffles, and the Kiai Tumangun Kanchanagara. The curse formula has become the only thing that people remember or in general know about the Sangguran stone. Of course, it is not true as the content of the inscription is much more than that. The discussion of the content of the inscription started more than 20 years after the stone had been transferred to Scotland. It was in between 1836, 1839, a facsimile, a part of the inscription was published in the second volumes of Carl Wilhelm von Baron Humboldt. This facsimile was later transcribed and discussed by Cohen Stewart of Leiden, appearing as Article 29 in his 1875 publication entitled Kawi or Kondan in Leiden and Transcripted. Sorry if my touch is not um, correct. Exactly a hundred years after its removal from Java, it was in 1913 that the transcription of the entire stone finally appeared in Angus Chrome's old Japanese organ. The stone was subsequently discussed by Damei between 1951 and 1955. Damei corrected Prandes' reading of the date from 846 Saka to 850 Saka year. Damei concluded that the exact date um, of the inscriptions is 2nd of August, um, 928 AD. Then in 1972, an English translation was made available by Himan Subustan Sarkar in the second volume of his, of his corpus of the inscription of Java. A visit to Minto House in 1999 by the Japanese scholar Kozu Nagada resulted in a new wrappings of the inscriptions copies of which are currently in the possession of the Minto family. And the latest publication of the inscriptions come from the Indonesian scholar, Hassan Javar, who during his study in Leiden in the mid eighties, worked together with his teacher, the Kasparis, uh, preparing an edition of the inscriptions, which eventually published only in 27. So the texts are engraved. Got, the... sorry, it's really quick. Uh, you got three or four minutes left. Thanks. Sorry, three, four minutes? Yeah, three minutes. Oh my God. Okay. Well, right. Um, right. So, the, um, okay, so basically, the general structures of the inscriptions are mostly the same as the um, inscriptions you know, issued during the same period. So it starts with the openings. Um, 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 or mangala, um, two lines of Sanskrit. Well, this is this, this mangala is, is not something common. It follows by the date, uh, the name of the issuing king, Sri Maharaja Rakai Pangajatiya Wawa. And then we also have the rank of the official who received the king's order and the Sambada, the occasion, and um, the processions of the Manasuksima, list of the officials who came to the event, and also the Sapata, the cross formula, list of the misfortunes that will be encountered by those who um, broke the Sima or disturbed the Sima, and it ends with the name of the scribe or, or Chitraleka. Um, in short, the inscription records the favor of the illustrious great king Rangai Pangajadiyawawa, Sriwijaya Loka Namatunga, to the village of Sangguran, 
under Wahari district, which was marked out into a freehold for deity Patara of the Prasadaka Paktian temple in the freehold which belongs to the group of smiths at Mananjung. So the Minto stone is the last or the Sangguran, Prasasi Sangguran is the last known recorded documents issued by the Salidra rulers of the ancient Mataram. Uh, the Sangguran inscriptions refers to the prince named Sindok, who was then found new dynasty in East Java in the year 851, just a year after this inscription issued. And in fact, um, Sindok um, issued quite a large number of the inscriptions in 851. Um, and the importance of the stone was understood well by the people of Ngandat, who then decided to create a replica or memorial stone in 2019. The two central figures in the creations of this replica are Papa Sunarto and Papa Kalo, the gentleman you are uh, seeing on the screen. Papa Kalo himself is the resident of Ngandat. Um, and with the help of four university students, namely Adit and Joko, who are uh, majoring in history, as well as Remy and Aska, who are majoring in design, it took three months for the team to complete the replica. The replica is made of concrete and it is designed to resemble the original one. The dimension, the number of lines of aksaras are made exactly the same as the ones in the Scotland. Throughout the creation of the replica, rituals were carried out. A good day was chosen to start the project and the team also underwent some fasting. So one finished, the stone was installed in the most sacred place in the hamlet of Ngandat, namely Pundian Bah Tarmina, a respected local figure who was thought to be a female warrior in the past. It stands on a yoni under a big peringin or banyan tree and close to a spring. You can also see the picture of the old Japanese aksaras um, made of wire. The erection of the replica was intended to mimic the procession of Manusuksima or marking out the freehold in the ancient times. The procession involved a Hindu priest who led the ceremony witnessed by the local authorities and it ended with the guests enjoying the prepared food and drinks of which some of them are also found in the Manusuk Sima ceremony in the ancient times. The replica is in, intended as a reminder for people of Nanda that there was once an important stone inscription standing in their line, in their land, and that the inscription is not only talking about the curse, but it highlights how precious their area was in ancient time, so that it was granted a freehold by the king. Annual event to celebrate the inauguration of the stone every 2nd of August is done by local people of Nandat. It ranges from the public discussion about the stone in particular or history in general, as well as other cultural activities such as traditional dance performances. Despite the fact that the stone is some 12,000 kilometers away from its original place, the stone will forever be remembered and close to the heart of people in Nandat. Thank you very much. You echo right, right on time. Um, yeah, great. I'm gonna open it up for questions. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask one first, and then I think we can, yeah, if we can call up the chat uh, on the screen, then I can read it directly from that. Um, yeah, thank you. Really fascinating. Um, very interested about the actual replica and and the sort of process behind that. I think we've, you know, touched on these issues today, but um, I was wondering um, how much the again the views of these local people have been taken into account in terms of potential restitution of the Lord Minto stone, or if not, um, I know maybe you don't want to go there, but is there, is this completely driven by the, like a grassroots movement by the local people, or is there also coordination with uh, government agencies, uh, Indonesian government agencies? Thanks. Yeah. Um, the local people knows exactly that it is rather difficult or rather impossible to have the stone back to their um, hamlet. If ever the stone come back to Indonesia, it must, it would have been placed in National Museum in Jakarta. So the hope of the stone to be back in, in, in the hamlet of Ngandat is, 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 is not in the heart of their people in Ngandat. Um, I hope that's answered your, your first question. The second question is um, the project of uh, creating the replica. Well, initially there was a discussion with the local authorities and it seems that, well, this is based on my interview with Papa Kalu um, when I visited the replica. Uh, it seems that the local government um, did not really 
your interest in making the replica. So the money, the energy, and everything were done, um, were initiated by these two figures, Papa Sunarto and Papa Galo, and um, being helped by these four um, students who are also um, interested in, in, in learning um, history, especially the Sangor, because, because some of them actually from Malang, so it's quite close to, to, to Dungandat, where the, uh, the stone is, uh, was um, discovered. Thank you. I've lots more to ask, but I'll open it up. I'll open it up to the room first. Is anybody in the room? Yeah, the lady in the front. Did you hear that echo? Oh, I could, could not hear that. Could you repeat the question? Yes, why is the Minto family keeping this stone? It's a very good question. Yeah, it's not in a national collective. I actually have a follow up question then. Is that Minto stone, is it their property or is it now registered as? part of British patrimony? Oh, wow. Um, I think the stone is still there. And why is it, why they keep the stone? Well, because it's, well, it's a gift from Ruffles. It's sort of a tribute um, 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 from the land that once colonized. And it's also not just an object, I think, uh, this, this, this stone, because I heard that there's actually a ceremony of ritual, sort of rituals that the local peoples um, uh, regularly dance every year. So there's, they, they know they see it, but just as stones, but as probably part of the culture as well, so becoming part of the culture of the, the local peoples. So I hope that's answered the question. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, has there, been, has there been any formal request for it to be sent back? No, right? Yeah. There, well, now no, we're talking about the issue of the traditions, but I just, um, there was an attempt to bring the stone bags in 25, 26 by the government of Indonesia. And um, um, it seems um, it's not successful, but um, you can find it, the, the detailed reports on the on the medias. Um, okay. So we cannot contact, um, comment more about that. Okay. And um, we'll go to Ashley next. Thanks. Hi, Echo. Thank you very much. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you very hi. much for that, Echo. Really, really appreciate it. It's lovely to lovely to hear your research um, at the moment. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the decision uh, to place the place the inscription on a yoni to place that yoni under a banyan tree, which is next to a river source or to a water source, um, and to effectively if I understand what the Sema ceremony is there, to effectively treat it as if it were a statue in that whole process. Um, was that, where, how was that decision made? And is there some precedent for effectively worshiping the, the inscription as if it were uh, a divinity? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, um, Leslie, for the questions. Um, the site, um, it's Pundian Bahtarbira, uh, Pundian again that referred to this uh, most sacred place, is chosen because it is Pundian is the most sacred place first, and then um, um, the decision to put uh, the inscriptions on Yoni's pure um, discussions or arrangements between these two elders, uh, because it seems um, it is actually widely as a, a known that Yoni is a uh, symbol of the fertility, um, bring the, the prosperity and the setting in the, well, if you ever go to Indonesia, um, actually, almost in every Pundian is actually, it has a big tree, yeah? But this specific Pundian is also, also special because it has the, the spring. I'm recording with the possessions, the Manusuksima, the demarcation of the land. It is actually um, um, written in the inscription itself. Um, the detail of the processions um, where the priest um, started to um, open or begin the ceremony and then is followed by the rituals of uh, breaking the chicken's uh, um, 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 leg and also there are some drawings of the eggs and um, the list of the food, the list of the twins that they are there. Um, the the gifts that the the the, the village have to be 
prepared and also sent to the uh, um, um, those witnesses who comes to the ceremony. So, so the um, the possession of the Manusukshima was inspired from the inscription itself, although it's not exactly the same. Um, but they try to be as close as possible. Um, the replica, because it is located in Punden, even without the even without the replica, people would still go to the Punden for the special occasions. Um, moreover, now that we have the replica, then people, I think more and more people visit the 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 Pundans to just put some offerings, and then especially uh, if you have a big events, wedding ceremony, and so on and so forth, you would go to Punden and then present offerings and then pray there. And I hope that answers your question nicely. Right. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll have to move on. Elizabeth, if you could ask her. No, I, I'll have to move on to the next speaker. Yeah, you can You can email Echo, you, I'm sure. Sorry. All right. Thanks, Echo. That was really fascinating. Thank you very much. You see, it's already generated lots of debate and questions. Really fascinating. Um, okay, great. A round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving swiftly on. Um, next up, we have... Um, Ayu Dipti Karina, she is um, Archaeological Collection Manager at Muse Museum Sunabadayo in Yogyakarta, Java. And uh, we should say at the start, thank you for making the trip here. I heard it was somewhat eventful, and but you've made it in one piece, so we do really appreciate that. Um, yeah, she holds a, a master's degree in anthropological studies from Universitas Gajamada, Indonesia. She is currently yet yeah, Archaeological Collections Manager manager at that museum. Uh, she researches collections as part of her curatorial work on exhibition themes such as ethno-astronomy in Java. I'm quite fascinated to learn about what that is. Um, and Bali, uh, silver industry at uh, Kutugede, Yogyakarta. And the latest, she looks at children in Japanese culture. In May 2021, she became part of the curatorial team at the AIM project, which is a collaborative project between the governments of Australia and Indonesia to develop joint exhibitions on maritime cultural issues between the two countries. Um, and her talk is preliminary research on circulation of the recent uh, Wilkins collection in the Sonobadayo Museum. Uh, yep, Corinne, over to you, thank you. Thank you, St Stephen. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to meet you. Thank you for the opportunity. I think um, it's I cannot really speak English very well. I hope you all understand that it's very difficult for me to, if it's quite difficult to understand, but I try my best. Um, so I, th I start this research uh, because it's based from the classic problem in Indonesian museum about the provenance. We always ask by the people, by the scholar, or by the students who came to museum and where are the objects are come from? And usually the museologists in Indonesia, museum practice in Indonesia, it's very difficult to answer, to answer the question. We, we, di we didn't really know where are the objects are come from. So in 2000 and 2019, I have started this research on the provenance collection, uh, especially in the archeological collection in Sonobudoyo. So, uh, so uh, basically, Sonobudoyo Museum is our, the museum that developed in the colonial period in Yogyakarta. It's established on 6 November in 1935, and it was initiated by the cultural organization called the Java Institute that they aim to nurturing the indigenous culture of the Dutch is in this, especially in the Java, Chirabon, Madura, Lomba, and Bali's culture. So uh, this museum, uh, is for, this is the opening ceremony of the museum Sonobudoyo in 1935. It's very festive. Um, the governor, the governor of the does come to the opening ceremony and the, it officiated by the Sultan Hamakobuana, the king of the Yogyakarta. 
This museum is the home for the 63 and more collection of consists of the archaeological artifact, ethnography objects like Korea's batik textile, wayang, wooden marks, Japanese manuscript, lontar, and many, many more the object that collect. And it is collected since the Dutch colonial period to the present. The provenance collection of the Sonobudoyo, I think, is came from the donation of the Chafa Institute itself as the original one who built the museum. And it's and the other is loan from the Office of Archaeology at Yogyakarta, the, no, the donation from the Ministry of Education and Culture during the new order regime, um, public donation, and of course the procurement. So today I like to talk about the collection that came donated from the Chafa Institute because it came from the colonial period that. The Java Institute basically was formed in 1919 is to effort this culture organization is try to overcome the wave of the European culture that increasingly flooding the uh, the Indonesian at that time. This organization is try to preserve the heritage that from the local from the indigenous culture and the activity were include the held the cultural congress and established the craft school for the silver, the wood, and the, and the leather. And they arranged the exhibition program and also uh, been built the museum that became the Sonobudoyo nowadays. So the, basically the, the cultural congress that held by Chafa Institute in 1924 is agreed to open the ethnography museum in the, with the main storyline about the Chafanese culture and the greater Chafa. So this agreement leads to Chafa Institute documented the culture of Chafa, Madura, Bali, and Lombok. So on, start from the 1929, the book of, based from the book of the in him, I cannot speak that well, but it's they became the handbook for the collection of the collection in Sonobudoyo at the time. So, beside, beside the from the handbook, from the book, uh, that came Java Institute also approached to many people that. Uh, they have concern with the antiquities of Java. So one of the famous uh, collector that approached by the Java Institute and also the member of Java Institute itself is the uh, Mr. and Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Racing Wilkins. They both are the very famous as the cultural so socialita, some sort of like that. So. Um, but the the one who are most famous was the Anna Racing Wilkins, the the wife of the Thomas Wilkins. She is the third generation that live in third generation of uh, the Dutch people that live in uh, Indonesia since her since the born, and she is the daughter of the translator between the Sunan and the resident. She is a very, uh, live in a very uh, high position because of her family line. So they are, uh, both are the member of Java Institute organization. So Anna Racing Willigan is very generous to donate uh, many cultural objects to museum. So basically she is really, like to collect all the antiquities from around the Jogja, Jawa, Malang. Then when the Java Institute initiate to open the museum, she very generous to donate her collection to the museum. So uh, I found the archive from the KTLV. This is the home of the Anarasim Wilkins family in Yogyakarta in Gondomanan, but the home is are gone because of the war at 
around uh, 42. So basically this is their collection. We can see that she's really um, have a favor to collect of the Japanese because her background also to, uh, you know, it's it gives her the position in the society because of her collection, because of her interest in the collect the uh, indigenous object. She also has the very famous with the local and also with the from the Dutch itself. So, um, to give it, uh, so for I think it's about like, forty five years she collects. Uh, many objects the museum and because of her interest in collecting the Sutterham, uh, the, uh, the head of the Office of Archaeology, prized the Miss Racing Mullican's family because their collection artifact is very valuable and is able to provide an, an overview of the cultural reconstruction of the Hindu Buddhist period in Central Java. Later, the collection of racing musicals become the exhibition highlight of the golden period during the influence on Hinduism and Buddhism in Java in Sonobudoyo Museum up until now. Basically from, based from the, the other collection racing musicals that written by Sutterham, there are like 285 piece of the Hindu Buddhist object. So it's consists from the 11 parts like metal statue, stone statue, oil lamp, ritual ceremony equipment, inscription plate, votive tablet, and etc. There's so many uh, objects from Hinduism period that she collect. And this is the statue, the metal statue. Most of this collection that in here that I present you here is still in Sonobudoya, except on the three statue of that Tara. Not only for he she gives to Sonobudoya to Java Institute itself, but she also gives her piece of collection to the Rich Museum. Actually, there is there is one for a Manjustri statue. I think you know that, that, but I cannot find the picture yet. So, but uh, she's willing to give it to the royal. So I think, yeah, that's interesting. So, what 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 makes it interesting is um, one day I found this archive. This is the original. I I, I just think this is the original signature of the Asia Anarasi Mulikans and is coming from, I don't know, maybe it's 1942 or between the 20s to 40. This is became, became my uh, fundamental for our research in Sonobudoya to track down the, the, the collection of from Anarasi Mulikans that still intact in the museum because you know, there is there are true 200 more piece object, but fortunately, <laughs> I can say that we still have that 200 piece collection in Sonobudoyo because there's so many things happen between that time. There is a war and uh, the the son of the Anarasim Vilkans get the, the artifact and Maybe they split it. I don't know. It's we have we don't have any data about it. So, so nobody can measure the original number of the Resivulcan collection because, and then the, in 1943 during the Japanese occupation, Resivulcan's collection was transferred to the museum Sonobudoyo, but after the war situation and the stabilized more established in 1915 up until now, we cannot really say that the piece of the collection are still in the museum or in storage. There is a bomb during the, the war and it hits the 
exhibition room and it burned down the museum. Not all the, the building, but it's quite, they, they burned down many statues from the Bali collection. So basically what I did uh, on the research is, I can say I only can identify the, the number of the collection that that really came from the Anarasi Welcome. So there is the Devisri Bronze Statue, Vairochana Bronze Statue, Ganesha, Lupa or the oil lamp. So the inscription, Watantija, and uh, many more. And uh, based from this, we can say that Anarasi Welcome collect the collection around the Yogyakarta. She also collect, collect, uh, collect the relief and panel and and the seed stone from the Borobudur and Prambanan. I think um, she is very famous with her background as the collector. So many peasant or many farmer from Yogyakarta try to offer her to buy the, the collection. So, so I think like the, the Watantija, Watantija inscription. So, the, the peasant found the plate on 24, then the peasant is only one to analyzing we can, can buy, not even the office of archaeology can buy the inscription. But then after that, um, the analyzing we can then give to Sono Budoyo. So I think this challenge in the provenance research in Sono Budoyo, like, I know it's a very classic problem, but we, we like the original archive from the Chaffee Institute. The registry number are changing during the 18 years since the Chaffee Institute era was independent of the colonial new order. So it's like four times changing on the on the registry number. So we, so it's very difficult for, for us to track down the right uh, history of finance the collection. And also the limitation to understand the, the Dutch language. It's a very, we all, our stuff is only depends on the Google Translate. I know it's the worst of the worst, but we just, yeah, we just need the Google to give some big picture of what the archive states in that. I think um, this is my last presentation. Hope you, you can. Uh, <laughs> I would like to deliver my knowledge to my my colleagues in Sonu Budoya and Andrew Henderson. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Karin. That's a really great example of of collections research and, and object biographies and the importance behind it, but also the challenges. But you have a few Dutch colleagues in the audience here today so i think you should uh, get to know them and i'm sure they'd be willing to help you out with with translations in the future i think these yeah we you know collaborations are important and of course language is a is a key issue right in in, in trying to try to make this happen okay i'm going to open it up let's see is there any questions in the room first or uh leslie first and then we'll go to Raquel. Um, needing translations of old Dutch as well. If you were able to get it translated, would it make a huge difference? Do you think the answer is in the translations that you're looking for? The scripts that your text you're working on? Yes, because I think... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. If you... Oh, you I open the presentation? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. So... I think yes, because from the archive that I found with the hands writing from the NRS in Wilkins, it's very difficult to read it. Even uh, I think the translate uh, will make a better understanding because um, from we don't know the context if we cannot see. If you can see this. This is the list, the number of the collection. She write it down with the handwriting in that. Um, there, there, actually, there are a lot more paper 
I think there is like 200, not only the Hindu period object, but also the ethnography object like batik and the wooden craft that he donated to museum. But for us now in Sonobudoya, it's very, very, I think that the, the, the challenge that we face is the Dutch language barrier. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, Marike, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I, I have a factual question and a methodological question. Uh, I was wondering in which, where you found that, uh, uh, that document? The document. And uh, also if, I, I presume you are aware that, that there is an archive of the Java Institute in the National Archives in Jakarta. Um, but as far as I uh, have seen it, it, it doesn't have object uh, registration, but um, it may, may be helpful. Uh, there, there is correspondence. So that's one question where you found it, but then the other, and then I uh, talk from my experience in the pilot project uh, provenance research of objects acquired in the colonial era Porsche which has been conducted the past two years in the Netherlands uh, and because of COVID was restricted to the <laughs> Netherlands, whereas we had these ideal ambitions to, to collaborate with Indonesians and to go at location and to, uh, to go beyond Dutch sources. So uh, remembering the list on your PowerPoints with the objects and the location of provenance, do you have time, so that's the first thing, uh, also to, to pick out some of the objects and go to the place and start from there, just ask, talking with all people uh, um, as a, at the location uh, and to see if you have, you may hear stories about family or, or people who saw something which taken taken away or so to, to um, to get to the yeah the local narratives, um, did, did you do that? And uh, and I, I know I mean this this uh, asks for an enormous amount of time, <laughs> so don't do all the objects. But um, yeah, and I'm happy to translate. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, I don't know if I'm like so. The archive are found inside the catalog that came from this. So the, the, the archive are inside this catalog. I don't know, it's very lucky for me to find this. It's not even in the library or the archive, it's just come from the nowhere. I don't know. My colleague is hand over it, hand over it to me. And you can see this is your, <laughs> this is your job to find it. Okay. So, uh, but also, yeah. I think uh, from the location itself, I found it on the Sutterham's writing about the, the initial or the origin uh, collection that when it's come from the Piungan or the village around in Tukja. So I make some uh, to cross check between two archives, between two archives, so I cross check it. I think I, I, I we haven't tried to find the archive. Uh, we haven't tried to go the field, so maybe it's it's uh, good <laughs> for us to to find it. Thank you, uh, Peter. I wonder, do you know uh, Francine Brinkgeven? You could contact her. She's in Leiden, and she worked on the collection. Basing that's in the museum in Leiden, so I can I can give you her her uh, mail, mail list. And the other thing that may help you, but I can't. I, it's a long time ago that it was in Sonne Sonne Budoyo, uh, but um, what may help you, I don't remember. Do the objects have numbers? Because you know you, you said there has been a change in numbering several times, etc. And I know that phenomena. But sometimes it's possible to recognize the style of the numbering. The person who makes the numbers in the, on the objects is sometimes recognizable. It is hand, his or her hand, handwriting. Uh, is, is that an option to look at? 
um, for the registry number is uh, so I have the another catalog that came from the 1935 for the opening, but it's a very different registry number from the Chafa Institute. So uh, we haven't find the original registry number for the Chafa Institute or the Sonobudoyo original. So so it's so those numbers are no longer on the objects are those numbers on the objects themselves are the, the sometimes there is in the object but sometimes it's finished hmm. it's already i don't know if the part of the conservation before so it's gone because the the conservator is uh, make it clean or it's just not main, not every statue or the every object has the number in in tag with the object anymore. So okay, thank you. I wanted to know: um, Did she have any strategy of collecting, or did she just collect what was offered to her? I don't know. She just collect from the Chafanis. If I can see uh, the, the pattern of the collection from the NRS Wilkins, she just collect the around from the Chafa, from the around of Yogyakarta. It's also contained with the batik and the, the wooden scraft, the ethnography objects. Mm, she just, I think, she just keep waiting till the the piece somebody offers the 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 object. She also, if I'm not mistaken, I read the article about the analysis you can see acquire from the other collector. So she buy it when the collector is dead, is dead, she buy the collector. But no strategy behind it. I don't think uh, I just around, but I see the just around the Chofa. Actually, okay. So Panga's question sort of follows up. Yeah. All right. Did she acquire objects freely, take them from sites through traders? I think you've answered that, or it's maybe it's that you can't establish whether she had a pattern. She she may have. It's just the the documentation is not there to reflect it. Oh, uh, okay. So it's from the trade. Sometimes the person. Uh, came to her and offers, but sometimes he acquires uh, mm. and go to the market and see that it can work with their her interest right. for the the yeah. ethnography object. But much more is they acquire from the field. All right, last one, William. Yeah, sorry, it's not even a proper question, <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to say that there's a lot of discussion in the museum world about uh, uh, cooperation with, with museums in Asia and in, and in uh, the Netherlands and in uh, other countries. Uh, and this is a really good example of, of how you've got a collection with, with pieces in Western museums and the Rijksmuseum in, in Leiden, um, and where, yeah, you have difficulties with the Dutch, but in, in the Netherlands, there's no problem <laughs> reading the Dutch. So this is this is a, be a great example of, of where you can have a, a really nice project. So, uh, yeah, talk to us afterwards. <laughs> talk to one, two, three, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll socially engineer it. All right, great. Thank you, Karen. That was really great, great presentation. And again, brought up lots of really interesting issues. So yeah, a round of applause, please. And I should be able to do your present. All right, yeah. Moving swiftly on, I think our, our final speaker is no stranger to anybody in the room, or he shouldn't be. I, I've known Ed for many years from my time in Singapore, but but even before that, I was I was familiar with his his work and publications. I think if anybody's looked at any type of archaeology of Srivijaya or Sumatra, you'll have come across uh, Professor Dr. E. Edwards McKinnon's work. Um, He's now retired, but um, he's still very active um, in archaeological research. Uh, he was initially involved in rubber planting in Sumatra, um, and he's been a long time, long time resident of Indonesia. Uh, he developed an interest in archaeology by finding Sumatra lids uh, in rubber plantations and discovering shell middles in Hinai and Kota China Harbor uh, site in 1974. 
His current research interests are medieval interregional maritime trade, Buddhist and Indianizing influence in Sumatra and archaeological ceramics. And his talk today is a hoard of Buddhist bronzes from Bula China, North Sumatra. Ed, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, I first of all would like to thank Leslie and the organizers for inviting us here. Uh, despite the long wait, we've been uh, given an opportunity to present what is essentially just a brief field report on the uh, discovery of a number of bronzes uh, from a previously unknown site on what is now a, a sugar plane, sugar cane plantation uh, to the north uh, west of Maidan City. <coughs> um, <coughs> essentially, there were um, a dozen uh, images. Uh, two standing Buddhas, which I'll describe, describe in more detail, uh, two fragments of Buddhas, two standing Avalokiteshvara images, which are probably uh, quite early for their type, a four-armed Avalokiteshvara image in a seated position, uh, a fragment which is rather badly corroded with a nimbus, a head only, uh, another image which uh, initially we thought might be a manjusri, but now we're undecided and have to, uh, it, it is as yet unidentified. There's a, a miniature Ganesha image, um, bit of fragments of the legs and the base and the hand. The hand may have come from the, the large standing Buddha at the top of the table. Um, there are three small later recoveries, a standing figure, a fragment, and a small goddess. Uh, numerous clay ceilings, of which I illustrate two, and also possibly from the very same site, but uh, as far as we know, it came from the, the, the neighboring hamlet of Paya Ambang, uh, an eight-armed Amoga Pasha image, which is um, quite unusual in this part of the world. Uh, uh, a general map of the area. Um, Bulu China, as you can see on the map here, is uh, next to Kota Rintang and inland from the harbour site of Kota China. The other places mentioned on the map are roughly contemporary with Kota China and uh, Bulu China. Perlak, which was a uh, presumably an early Persian settlement, Samudra Pasa, of course, which uh, was an early Islamic settlement. Then at the tip of Aceh, Lamri or Lamuri and Fansur uh, on the Aceh Basar coast. And on the west coast of Sumatra, of course, Lobotua, which has been excavated by the AFAO and the, the Pusat Penelity and Archaeology in Jakarta, which is near Baros. And the more recently uh, discovered site in the village of Jago Jago, which we call Lumot or um, Bongao. And this is uh, extremely interesting because it could be quite early. Uh, a map of Kutarantang, uh, Paya Ambo, you can see, is on the uh, left of the map. That is on the edge of what is uh, tidal swampland, and the area below it is what is now the sugar pl uh, cane plantation. And uh, the, the rest of the area was never uh, closely looked at by the Dutch people because it was tidal swamp and not very fertile. But the uh, uh, Buluchina plantation concession was originally tobacco opened up in the uh, mid-late 19th century and is still under plantation land. Uh, this is a picture of the site. Actually, the bronzes were found to the right of this track in amongst all the sugar cane and the, uh, the woods in the distance are the hamlet of Paya Ambang. That's only about 100 metres away on the... Uh, edge of the swampland. 
Uh, the site was appeared to have been the location of a small religious edifice dating from the mid late first millennium of the current era. It came to light actually about five years ago, following the accidental discovery of a hoard of Buddhist bronzes just 100 meters from the border of the, uh, the estate with the hamlet of Paya Ambo in the village of Kutarantang, a sub district of Hampar and Perak which is Delhi Serdang region of North Sumatra. It's immediately northwest of the city of Maidan. The hoard comprises 14 bronze alloy images and or significant fragments, all of which, with the exception of a small Ganesh, were damaged in some way. These are a standing Buddha, uh, the, the large image, which uh, I'll show you in a moment, two standing two-armed Avalokiteshvara images, a seated Dhyama Buddhi, a Buddha, uh, and a, a Mogapasha image, a Buddha head, a four-armed seated Avalokiteshvara image, and an Avalokiteshvara head and shoulders, and another with a high Makara. Uh, and there's also a seated image of a yet, a, yet unidentified Bodhisattva figure and the lower part of a standing image together with the seated uh, Ganesha. Uh, this is the standing Buddha. It's 38.5 uh, centimeters in height, so quite significant. Unfortunately, as you can see, somewhat damaged. Uh, in the open mode, with the uh, uh, right arm broken off just below the shoulder and the left uh, arm and hand missing, but um, the hand, which I'll show later, may have well come from this image. This is really quite an, uh, a significant find. Also, a smaller standing Buddha fragment, 18.5 centimeters in height, with the lower part below the knees uh, missing, again in the open mode, uh, with the right hand raised in a Baya Mudra and the left uh, partially uh, missing. I should explain that neither my colleague Ikhwan Nasari or I are really iconographers, so we, we don't really know very much about the uh, stylistic affinities of the images, but um, we've tried to <clears throat> present the uh, photographs so that others can at least analyze what they might be. Uh, this is uh, um, gilt on bronze seated Buddha, Buddha and Mogasiddhi image, uh, height 19th century, but as you can see, rather badly corroded. Uh, the nimbus is intact, the right hand raised in a Baya Mudra the mudra of reassurance, safety, and protection. But the, the, uh, whatever the left hand was holding is uh, broken off and not identified. Um, a Buddha fragment, the head and upper parts of the torso only. This is quite small, just six and a half centimeters in height. Uh, the image is in the open mode with the right hand in the Baya Mudra and uh, it has a low ushnisha with tight curls. I'm afraid the, the picture is not as clear as it might be. Um, then we have uh, two Avalokiteshvara images, almost complete, standing images of Avalokiteshvara, a seated forearm version, and fragments of two other images, one displaying a nimbus and the second with a high makota, which were all recovered in the same location. I should ex perhaps explain that uh, the, the chap that found these things was actually just a plantation worker. And uh, he hasn't explained why he was digging in this particular plant, uh, location, but it could have been that one of the pieces was brought to the surface and he spotted it and then continued to dig and found all the rest. Um, I've been to the site. Uh, there's not much to see on the surface. 
it's all very badly ploughed up because of the uh, sugar cane. But uh, almost all of the images, in fact, are quite badly corroded. Um, and we, there's nobody locally who knows how to clean this material, so it's better just left for the time being. Um, a standard a standing image with a nimbus, which is 14 centimeters in height, uh, almost complete except for the arms and hands. Um, and you can see the uh, Diana Buddha, Buddha in the Makota. Um, unfortunately, the, the other missing pieces haven't turned up. Uh, a second image of a similar type, height, uh, 11 centimeters. Um, both hands and the feet are missing. And of course, you can see the, the face is horribly uh, corroded and disfigured. But perhaps if it was cleaned up, it might be a much more presentable um, picture. This, <clears throat> the odd, odd piece out, actually uh, no sign of corrosion on this, highly polished, rather worn, seated image of a forearm Babola Kishisvara seated on a lion throne is 16.5 centimeters in height. Um, we haven't been able to work out why this should be so uh, highly polished and free of corrosion, whereas all the other pieces do in fact seem to be quite badly damaged. The uh, head, of another image, very heavily corroded. This is only 5.5 centimeters in height. Uh, the head and shoulders and the uh, Diana Buddha in the, in the Makota. Then uh, this head only 5.5 centimeters in height, again, quite badly corroded in parts. Um, but the uh, Buddha Amitabha in the, in the high Makota is, is, is uh, clearly visible. And I have two pictures from the, the sides. Um, this is somewhat similar to the image, which the stone image, which was discovered in Aceh. But I think these are probably a couple of centuries earlier. Um, the features on this seem to be quite well preserved. Then um, this is the unidentified image, which we originally thought might be a Manjushri, but now we have doubts about it. The height, 7.3 centimeters and 7.5 centimeters in, in uh, width. But as you can see, quite badly corroded. And this, I thought, was one among the, the most interesting pieces in the collection. Uh, a very plain, small uh, Ganesh, devoid of any kind of decoration. Um, there is a somewhat similar stone image in the uh, museum in Chennai. Um, and I think it's possibly fairly early in the dates from about the 8th to 9th centuries. Um, very unusual. Uh, I don't know of any other similar images uh, of this nature found in Sumatra or even in Java. And then um, the two fragments, the lower part of a standing image with a base, and on the right is the hand, which may, may have come from the large standing Buddha, uh, holding something. Um, you can't really see what it is. And then, uh, latterly, uh, a colleague went back to the site with a metal detector and dug up these three pieces. Uh, the one on the right is obviously a, uh, a goddess, but what the other two are, I have no idea what they might be. Uh, the one on the left looks particularly crudely made, very small. Um, 
So that is pretty well all the ones that we know of that came from this particular site in the sugarcane plantation. But uh, the local archaeological institute carried out a brief survey um, a few months ago, and they came up with uh, numerous clay ceilings from around about the same location, uh, some ceramic fragments, um, which are Tang Dynasty Chinese stonewares, and uh, fragments of glass. As far as I know, no one has been able to decipher the inscriptions on these ceilings as yet. But perhaps with uh, better, better photographs, somebody will be able to make something of it. Um, and finally, this uh, eight-armed Mogapasha image may have come from this site, but uh, it was brought uh, to another private collection um, by somebody else saying it had come from Paya Ambul, which is only 100 meters away from the site, but it could be part of the same um, hoard. Uh, this is pretty well uh, preserved. It, it would appear to have South uh, Indian characteristics. I'm afraid, sorry that the, the picture is not any better than this one. Um, but it's uh, worth noting that the um, Kacharantang site, which begins in Paya Ambul and stretches throughout the swamplands of Kacharantang, is littered with early uh, Islamic grave markers and a lot of ceramic material from the 11th to 14th centuries. And I, I'd just like to comment on the current cultural heritage legislation of law number 11 of 2010. Um, this delegates responsibility for all cultural heritage management to regional governors and region Cebu patties. And although very well intention, intentioned in delegating the responsibility to local authorities, there does not, however, seem to be any effective means to ensure that the system actually works, nor is there adequate provision for funding for the recovery of chance mines, at least in northern Sumatra, which is the area I'm familiar with. Consequently to this, um, some sites have proved very difficult to protect and several have been destroyed due to the lack of interest or understanding of the local authorities. Um, the pressure on land exploitation for new housing uh, in particular has been uh, a major factor in this uh, issue. But, uh, and consequently, numerous issues that have been dug up in the area over the last few years have often found their way into the hands of private collectors rather than into the uh, regional museum. So finally, in conclusion, I'd just like to say that uh, the recoveries at Buluchina uh, reflect the earliest Buddhist activity in northeastern Sumatra known to date. The location of the finds in Buluchina, which also includes several clay ceilings and glass fragments, is presumably the site of a former monastery or vihara, which was a, once a focus for pilgrimage. These recoveries are of considerable importance as they provide evidence for an additional early phase in North Sumatran history and previously unknown Buddhist activity in a resource-rich area in close proximity to Kida, because the coatless part of North Sumatra is only one day's sail away from the west coast of Sumatra. So the communication between Kedah and Sung, uh, the developments there were probably linked together at one point. So the, and of course, Kedah was considered to be the western part of the erstwhile Buddhist polity of Sri Vijaya. Then uh, Kedah, of course, was conquered by the Cholas in the early 11th century. And 
uh, a well-established Tamil presence in this region is known from Kotachina, uh, Lobotua on the west coast, and now this most recent site of Lumut or Bongahol, which is on the west coast on Tapanuli Bay. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, for a yeah, fascinating discovery, really interesting um, material. Anybody, questions in the room first? Yeah, um, Mylin. We just wondering, who is Mr. Oi? You mentioned Mr. Oi on the first uh, slide. Straight, straight and, to business. And, <laughs> yes, I mean, it, it's always uh, an obstacle, yeah, with, with the owners of the land, and then so, the, uh, is, is, is this the, the site issue? The is part of a nationally owned uh, sugar plant, sugar cane plantation. Mr. Wee actually pronounces his name, is a um, supermarket owner, a Chinese gentleman who's been in business for something like 20 years and has been collecting bits and pieces. He, he has a magpie collection of all sorts of things. <coughs> Sorry, a, a magpie collection of all sorts of local. Um, cultural artifacts, chrises, um, bronzes, uh, cloth, uh, beads, uh, the clay ceilings, coins, any, anything that dealers bring along to him, he, he seems to buy them all up and <clears throat> uh, just make part of his collection. We were very fortunate to dis discover these things um, when uh, my colleague Ichwan uh, got to meet him and he, he then uh, very kindly allowed us to come and to photograph uh, the objects which he has there. Um, no attempt has been made yet to, to clean them because there's nobody that has the appropriate expertise yet. Any other questions in the room? Yep, the front. Thank you for pointing out uh, the weak points of the legislation concerning cultural property. I think this is one of the major issues also concerning repatriation or returning artifacts, because uh, according to international law, uh, uh, only state parties are responsible and are, part, uh, yes, are partners of these legislations. And on the other hand, only state institutions such as official museums are the target of claims for restitutions, mm. while private collectors can do whatever they like. And this displays a major difference mm -hmm. of the objects. On the one hand, they are documents of the universal human history in <coughs> museums. And on the other hand, like Mr. Bui, or also uh, like uh, uh, Lizzie already it's a commodity to be traded on an international art market. And I think we should be aware that such objects, they are in their materiality, just the same. But the use of it today, it's really uh, words apart. And um, yes, no restitution claims for restitution or repatriation um, to its um, private owners, because the whole legislation is coined or stamped by the idea of private property this week. And if I just make, make um, another comment on Ulochtina, um, you think that it was probably a monastery there, like you mentioned the Chola. Um, though at the other, uh, on the other side, you mentioned the early Muslim graves. Do you think that the monastery was simply abandoned? Or was it a kind of iconoclasm when Islam came? Or I don't know how the Jola treated local cultures. I, I don't know. So <clears throat> um, it's possible that the uh, site was abandoned. Um, the, there, were, uh, there was obviously a connection between the people that lived in this immediate area and Cotachina because it, it's accessible by water. There's a river system which linked the two sites. Um, but the, the material that dates from here uh, is 
probably no later than the 9th, 10th century, if our guesswork is correct. Um, the experts in the field on iconography can probably correct me. Um, there's nothing later than that, as far as I know, in this immediate site. So I, I guess the place was abandoned. Uh, but for some reason, this was the area into which the first Islamic uh, movement took over. Um, and it's mentioned in the Sijara Malayu, actually, that, that uh, Sheikh Ismail came past the sites in Aceh and down the east coast of Sumatra to Aru. And this, this site is connected with the former polity of Aru and then went back to um, Perlak and uh, Samudra Pase. Uh, I, I would imagine for some reason it had been abandoned rather earlier than the arrival of Islam. I, I have a follow-up question, if you don't mind. Yeah, I have a follow-up question. So the bronzes that you've discovered are small, highly portable, yeah. um, sort of votive tablets or ceilings, if you want to call them that. So do you think they originated at that site or they were imported from elsewhere? And if it's the latter, um, where are you thinking? Because that, again, I think is quite an important issue. Um, at this moment, I would say impossible to answer. Uh, there certainly appear to be South Indian influences in the stylistic affinities of the things. Um, <clears throat> but if we look at what happened in South India, uh, metal working very often took place within a chandi or temple complex. So th this, these may well have been scrap uh, images waiting to be reprocessed into something else and, and, and lost in the process. So no, that's only guesswork. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. My money might be on Kedah, but yeah, there's another follow-up, I think, is it? Yeah, I mean, it's something I'm thinking as well. You've made... Ed, I mean, you've said there might be a monastery there, but I um, mean, the archaeological evidence is maybe yes. thin. So I think that this is what the question is here. You know, what type of structural components um, have you found a lot of bricks? Yeah, or, you know, foundations and so forth. Um, but yeah, of course, it could be but made. There are work. indeed traces of a rectangular foundation at the site. And uh, long before we found this place, we'd found uh, large bricks scattered all over Kutarantang. So there was indeed a, a brick built construction of some form there, either on this particular site or elsewhere in, in, the, in the immediate area. Yeah, there certainly was. Okay, so yeah. there is some. Um, Leslie, you want to ask a question? Yes, I'm just stylist stylistically looking at the point of this, to say 9th, 10th century is, for me, is just too late. Mm -hmm. This okay. north from here, we have to look at 8th century for these, to relate them to South Indian in style. I mean, this really has nothing to do with Central Javanese style, which is the 8th. So I think personally, with the whole influence from India, we've got to look at 8th century and earlier for this, especially the way the robe is fixed with a, a sash and a simple belt at the front, and the whole stylistic issue. So. Keep it earlier. I yeah, think, I definitely. would agree. I think it's probably seventh, eighth century or so. But yeah, I think there's more analysis needs to be done. Anyone else in the room? Anyone else online? I feel like an auctioneer now. <laughs> um, I actually, Elizabeth had a question for Echo. So if Echo's still here, Elizabeth, you could ask it. Sorry. I had two questions actually. One, the replica when it first came and the place was decided locally to, to install it. Um, was there a consecration ceremony to consecrate it? And, and was that group, was the group that, that got the replica and put it there, was it a religious group or a civil group? Um, you mentioned both civil and religious ceremonies today. And finally, it was to ask about the relationship between the the, the local use of the replica and the Department of Archaeology, you showed us some archaeological surveys and it came up earlier on the, the interface between things that, that tend to go back just to Jakarta. So no point to ask for them to come to our local place. So it was, was has that come into play at this site as well? Sorry, it's three questions. 
Okay, wow. Sorry, I cannot hear clearly because it's raining very hard here. Uh, could uh, you, Stephen, maybe can you, can you make or, it short? Uh, ceremony to install. Mm -hmm. Ceremony to install the replica was the mm -hmm. ceremony, the, the replica group, civil or religious, and three interface between the Department of Archaeology and the replica group, whatever we may call them. I don't know their name. Okay, right. So the first, the ceremony is uh, basically, I think that I mentioned earlier that it was um, basically written on the inscription itself. So generally in a large stone inscriptions, it consists the steps, the procedures of the demarcations of the freehold of the Sima. Um, the details um, the details of the ceremony is actually uh, usually written on the inscription. So that's the idea that the group use to sort of mimic um, the manuscript sima for the replica itself, although it's not exactly the same, but the idea is is is, is copied from the from the um, 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 original text uh, engraved for the student. The groups who decided to make the replica, well, yeah, um, there are local community who concerned about the history. They love the history in general, and then. Um, the fact that they knew that this, this stones was originated from their area sort of boost their um, um, spirit um, 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 to make the replica and to make to make a wider audience know that the, the stone is not only merely about the curse because if you look at the online um, media the content of the descriptions of the sanguran then it's everything will be talking about the curse formula um, while well, in fact it actually more than that. So the um, the locals people wanted to to let people know that uh, it is not just about the curse and it is not the cursed land. More than that, it is actually a special land because it was granted a freehold by the king. Um, the third question actually I didn't get it quite clearly. Um, again, sorry, it's raining very hard here. <laughs> The third question is about, it came up um, in the first talk on the keynote speech as well as on the oh, interface wow. between the archaeological authority and local groups. Mm -hmm. you, you showed some archaeological survey. Yes, yes. The, um, well, the survey was done because the, there was a report from the locals that um, the structure was made, but it has nothing to do with the site of the replica, which is not situated because there is actually nothing um, 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 ancient on the, on, the, on the place where the, the replica is, uh, is situated. Um, Ed, is, is Sorry. Ed wanted to follow up. Yeah, well, not, not about this, but if I can comment on the return of the stone from Minto to Jakarta, I remember something like 20 years ago, there was quite considerable correspondence between the archaeological center in Jakarta and the Minto family. Um, but for some reason, it just fizzled out and I haven't heard any more about it. <laughs> Interesting. All right. I think on that note, I should thank uh, Echo. Thank you so much for joining us Thanks. from um, Java today and staying on online. Uh, Ed, uh, for his fascinating talk, and Karina as well. Really, three very stimulating uh, um, presentations and discussions. So, yeah. All right. I think it's lunchtime. So, thank you, everybody.